hi there. If we haven't met yet, I'm Emily D. Baker. I'm the badass lawyer, host of The Emily Show podcast, and I am a legal commentator breaking down the legal shit behind the news and pop culture stories that we all want to talk about. I have been a licensed attorney for over 15 years, but this is not legal advice. I am a big fan of the cursey words, so headphones are recommended. This is where the law nerds unite with facts, not fuckery. Happy Tuesday, friends. It's time for coffee and cursey words. I'm tired. <laughs> I, th- we've got a messy bun. We've got coffee. We've got water. <laughs> I've got things. Oh, and of course now I've messed up my white balance by holding things up of professionals here, people. Um, I did a quick Sunday unboxing on Instagram. If you haven't caught it, it has this bracelet sent to me by one of you awesome law nerds. It is Morse code (laughs) for zero fucks given, (laughs) which always then triggers the Erica Jane song in my head, which is none, not one. How many? Look, it's a bop. I know I, I don't love these Girardi cases. The song still gets stuck in my head. Also, I wanted to give a shout out to the text crew. I'm just going to put the things up so that if you guys don't follow me in the places, we're at almost 1,400 friends over on the Instagrams. Crazy, right? So if you do not follow me on the Instagrams, I mean, if you're on your device, don't do that now. But when you're done, go do that. But one of our amazing law nerds, and I want to make sure that I get the name right, the things I do to prep. I was actually looking at law stuff before I came on and I was like, ah, I forgot to pull the thing up that I wanted to share with all of you because one of our amazing law nerds welcomed a tiny, tiny law nerd and let me know in the text crew. So Cheryl, congratulations on your tiny, tiny law nerd. I wanted to make sure I didn't get it right because I get names wrong all the time. And if you guys are in the text crew, first, can we get a shout out in the chat to Cheryl? I'm sure she'll see it at some point. Um, congratulations on your newest member of your family. That's so exciting. Text crew is for anyone in North America. We are working on expanding it. You can just hit textemily.com on your device and it will pop it up. So if you're on your phone and you hit textemily, it'll just pop it all up for you. And then it is a two-way communication between you and me. It's not a group text, but I do see the text. I don't get to all of them because there's over 2000 of us on the text crew, but I do see more of them than I can respond to. And if you are different levels of channel member, there are keywords that you put in and then those get answered much more frequently because they're in their own little special group and I can see them and get back to the members and chat with you guys. But it's for everyone. I can update you there when shit's happening. I can chat with you there, let you know. So the text crew is a way to keep in touch. I literally don't use email anymore. (laughs) So I use that. I love seeing you guys all congratulate uh, Cheryl in the chat. That's so sweet. I love the community here. It has been like a really crazy week on social media and contentious. And I feel like the we're not going to talk about politics stuff. I have an episode tomorrow of the Get Legit Law and Shit podcast, kind of breaking down what happened in the Capitol from my perspective and then from the legal perspective, the impeachment just from my perspective, the 25th Amendment, what it means, if I think that that's going to happen or not, and then touching on the fact that we have some conversations to be had around social media, what social media can and can't do as private companies, whether those are good things or bad things, what I think about Section 230, all this stuff. So that's all in the sit down video for the podcast that premieres tomorrow at 11. Um, So it's political topics, but it's not political, because what we're not going to do is come up here and be more divisive and judge the people. Other than the people that did the things, we can judge the shit out of them. If there's photos of people storming the Capitol, go ahead judge away. (laughs) But we're not going to um, judge one another. I think most of the country is horrified by what happened on the Capitol. So that's where we're at. So today I put it out to our top two tiers of members um, and asked them what they wanted to talk about today. And everybody today was like, y'all, 
Well, not everybody, but a lot. We're like, today, let's just do some pop culture stuff. We all need a minute. So let's pop culture it up. Let's take a minute. Let's talk about stuff that at the end of the day, the pop culture stuff right now are serious allegations and serious lawsuits, but it doesn't affect all of our lives the same way. Like it doesn't. It really, at the end of the day, if the Girardis go bankrupt, we're going to watch it play out on Real Housewives. And then we're going to be like, okay, I mean, it sucks to be them. We watched it play out. The people in the Girardi case that I feel the worst for are all of the current clients, the past clients, and everyone trying to figure out where they fall. Because now that he's been forced into bankruptcy, he still has active cases that are still like floundering around. So before I jump all the way into that topic, I just wanted to check in on the chat, give you guys a breakdown of um, what's coming up this week and, you know, give ample opportunity for the people that come into the contents and be like, oh my God, oh my God. Um, You talk for like 20 minutes before you get to a topic. Uh Uh-huh, I do. So I need to like keep that energy. (laughs) And I also timestamp ship for that reason. So that's what we're doing. So tomorrow at 11, there will be kind of a breakdown of where we're at with the Apollo political stuff. And a lot of it is world stuff. These are questions of our democracy and the constitution. And I really approach it from that place um, because judging people is not what we're going to happen. So then on Friday, we have Friday night live. I, it is my goal unless other shit happens. Like every week I'm like, it is my goal. It is my goal. It is my goal. So My goal is that I get another sit-down video up breaking down some of the documents in the Girardi case. Today, we're doing like an overview update of what's going on, but there's some more declarations that have been filed. I am hoping to get to them, but then there was salt sea sass on Twitter, and I'm like, there might be more KJ filings this week. And the KJ case is moving faster than even the Girardi cases, and the Girardi cases are so many cases So we're just going to keep it rolling. Those are the live schedules. I'm behind on recorded videos. So it's like me now trying to catch up with all the shit. So, so I, um, I see the chat talking about the Ted talk. You guys, the views on the Ted talk have absolutely skyrocketed. That is on the Ted X YouTube channel. It's not on my channel because it was a TED talk, it's proprietary to them. So I don't have the back end analytics, but I've been watching that blow up and I am so appreciative. I've seen you guys talking about the TED talk on social media. It just absolutely, absolutely warms my heart that so many of you are finding it and are resonating with it. It's something that I'm very proud of. It is literally my heart. Um, Diva views. Yes. Lots of Swedes in the chat. I love our Swedish friends. And I've seen the podcast trending in Sweden for like the last two months. So (laughs) thank you guys. Um, It's been trending in like Great Britain and the Philippines and Australia and Canada as well. So that's been fun. The Emily show has definitely grown with this channel here. So thank you for the compliments on the TED talk. It is more of a talk about my process and how I changed from identifying myself around my job to really trying to pick a different way to be in the world. So it is it is not legal breakdowns. It's a more in-depth like how I process through information. And I've seen other creators talk about it. I saw Peter Mon talk about it, which absolutely warmed my heart and made me cry. I saw Adam McIntyre talk about it. And f- to see an 18-year-old say, this is how I'm going to start processing my path, I was just like, I wish I had that awareness at 18. At 18, I was like, "Ah." (laughs) literally me through 18 to like, well, kind of now. (laughs) I am trying to remember not to drink into the mic, y'all. I am trying, but I just, I love to talk. (laughs) Octonation said TED Talk with purple hair next. I mean, I think there's definitely room for another TED Talk. Um, and that's fine. And yeah, purple hair is coming at 100k. Where are we at? Oh, you guys, we're at 76.1. Thank you. Thank 
you. Um, I'm going to tell you guys, since we're all just friends here and before we jump into topics and I mean, 3000 friends, it's, you know, there's so many friends, but that's okay. The Ted talk was something that was um, really caused me a lot of anxiety about doing. And I was really nervous. A, somebody else was filming it. I didn't have control over filming or production or lighting or how I looked. Um, I was still recovering from surgery. So I had some um, body insecurity going on before I recorded that talk. And it took a lot because I was still going through the transformation of trying to be comfortable with leaving the DA's office. I left the DA's office in February. I did the TED talk in April of 2017 and was still recovering from back surgeries and was still becoming more comfortable. My body changed a lot with kids and then with multiple surgeries after having kids. So I had a lot of real nerves about that. But the message was so important. I was like, girl, just get over yourself. Like, it's so easy to control your angles on YouTube and be like, okay, well, if we're this way, it's fine. When we turn the head, then we get the, we get the whole situation. And the older I'm getting, the less I'm, the more comfortable I am with myself and the less bothered I am. Because I know that the people want to hear the message and it's not really a bother. Like nobody's really like, oh, well, you know, definitely not a size two. Well, obviously. <laughs> so it, but I wanted to share that with you that it, it, there, the message was so important to me, but there was also nerves in doing it and in letting someone else control all those aspects. Cause up until then I had not really been on camera a ton. I had been on YouTube a little bit and sit down videos that I controlled. And if I didn't like the way I looked in a YouTube video, I could just delete it. <clears throat> I wasn't live streaming then. And so giving someone else control over that was very, very scary. And it was so freeing to just do it. And then now years later to see it gaining traction with an audience has just, it's just been so incredibly heartwarming. I want to make sure that I get to a few super chats and then we're going to dive into the Girardi stuff. So, um, Terex, are we still talking about the crystal ball case? We're going to get to the sir reply towards the end because it's short. And then there's some stuff going on on Twitter with Saltsy asking for evidence. And I'm going to give you an indication of what I think is happening or what I think might happen this week. And then we're, we're going to move on. We're going to mostly talk about the Girardi case and just chat with each other. Um, Carlo, I like that you give a 20 minute buffer before starting since sometimes I'm late. Um, and then I don't miss the tea. Well, you're welcome. I like, look, I love this community so much. I don't know if I can wear bracelets because I think you all can hear them. So if that becomes annoying, I'm going to have to just take them off. Um, the mods will let me know if the bracelets are too loud for sure. So I definitely, um, I completely lost my train of thought. Y'all just watched it happen contemporaneously. Sorry. Jen and Stitches said, I'm a TEDx organizer. That's so awesome. And I love your talk. I'm so excited for you and for the team that organized the events. It was really so, so good. The organizing team um, reached out to me to apply. I was an alumni of the school where I did it, which was very special to me. And it was a very, very special thing for me. So when I sit down and I have been, you know, noodling and starting to put down the process for facts, not fuckery into a book form, um, expanding some of the topics from my TED talk is definitely one of the things that will be happening in that book. So you guys, thank you. Thank you so much. Like it really is one of the things that's most special to me and that I love just Love, 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 love. So let me get to a few more super chats and then jump in. Um, creep show art. Wait, what's going on with Salty? There was Twitter sass creep show, and I know that you're not on Twitter, which I respect tremendously. I adore you. Hello. I will um I will pull up the tweets and just talk about it. So thank you for your support. Thank you for being here. And I will, for everyone watching on the replay, I will time stamp it. So yay, you guys are so <laughs> stars and skies. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'll take being the best YouTube lawyer. I'll totally take it. There are so many great lawyers with different perspectives on YouTube. It's really fun because in law, sometimes people get very competitive over their space. Like, no, this is my space. I do this kind of case. And it, look, you guys, there's room for everyone because all of us have different experience and different perspectives, which is what I love. There is different levels of SAS. There is different, um, beliefs, there's different 
types of cases that we talk about. You know, I definitely think of most of the YouTube lawyers that I watch. I am the most familiar with pop culture, but also I love pop culture. <laughs> So I think there are definitely other YouTube legal commentators that are way more up on the political stuff and spend much more energy in that push pull. It just, I worked in a political job because being a DA, your, your boss is elected. And so it's nice to take a step back into like real housewives and shit like that, because it just, it just is. So thank you for that. I love that there are so many of us with different perspectives because there's room for everyone to watch everyone up on the YouTubes. So thank you. Um, this, Anno, this is such a fantastic, um, point. Thank you. Ted talks really helped me through my depression. I thoroughly enjoyed yours, especially since I've been struggling with my place in the world and employment. That means it literally means the world to me. So thank you guys. Um, thank you so more so much. I saw Emily's Ted talk and it doesn't talk about her move. Is there more than one? There's not more than one. It talks about my shift from being a DA to, um, building my own life. It does not talk about my move because I didn't move until this year. So thank you guys so much for all of the positive feedback on that. Heather says, have you, or will you talk about the JLM Couture versus Haley page? I've talked about it. It is linked, but I'm going to do a sit down video on it as well. Cause there's some new information there and there's a lot, a lot of court documents, but there is a live where I talk about it. So if you search my channel by topic, it should come up under Haley page. If you search my videos, because it's in one of my live videos. So yes, Kelly, this is my new Gerard lip gloss today and a lip liner. It is this one. This is a uh, crystal or crystal. This is a like shiny goldy. And then I put it on over a lip gloss. I did because Jen was so kind to send those to me and it's not sticky. So I love it. I addressed Haley page. Um, Victoria, never thought I'd be watching lives about law and law adjacent stuff. Hi from South of Russia. Hello. What can the outcome for KJ be if she loses? We, when I get to the KJ stuff, I'll address it a little bit, but I'm going to address it from the legal side, not the financial side, because everyone's financial stuff is different, but it can pull, well, me, I'll address it later. Also me, let's talk about it now. <laughs> True story. Um, defamation violates a lot of social media platforms. So if she loses any of the defamation counts, I would imagine that Tati and her team will go after her social media accounts. That is my speculation. So that could be years from now. Of course, things can always settle. Do I think this case will settle? Not necessarily, but things can always settle. I, you guys, I love so much our international audience. I love all of our audience, but it just warms my heart that people are like, I want to know too. Love from Singapore. It's 1 a.m. here. Can't sleep. Welcome. So glad you get to hang out with the law nerds instead of sleeping. I will, I'll try to, I'll try to keep it calm today and just, just talk about it. Just talk about it gently so we can, we can lull our international crew to sleep. Um, it's Lizette. Your vulnerability was so worth it. Your TED talk is so encouraging. Thank you. I hope so. Okay, good. A few more and then we're going to roll on. Hi, Emily. Became a member finally after heavily debating it um, while over your content for the past few months. Love seeing your channel grow. Thank you so much. And Drew, thank you for becoming a member. It is, once again, these are always things that are up to you guys. Um, I appreciate the support as always. It allows me to continue to grow what we do here and bring on help so that I can keep up with the content that happens because so much happens. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, Lori Smith, thank you for the super chat. I don't know how it got rolled in the roll, but Lori's super chat said, um, you're the best. I loved your TED talk. Thank you, Lori, for your constant and unwavering support. Um, Ida Greenfield said, love your hair and your brains. I appreciate that. There's hair, brains, and sass. Michael, thank you so much for the super chat. It says, thank you everyone for all your support. I have to agree. Emily is better than all the pumpkin spice in the world. That is that is a that is a 10 out of 10 compliment. I appreciate it so much. It's Thumper. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Ah. Let's let's just I'm going to have to here's the thing. I was trying to figure out on StreamYard how to just put up little music clips for like changing topics so we can do a little uh uh uh, uh. guess what? 
I can't do it. It has to be a video clip. So um, I haven't chatted with Tech Valor about this because Tech Valor, you guys, made my intro clip. If you are a YouTuber and you love my intros, Tech Valor did those. My music um, that I use for the Emily Show podcast intro is music I had created for that. But she created the, took the audio and the music and the video clips and created that for me. So if you guys are YouTubers and need that kind of support, absolutely check out Tech Valor, check out her website. It's techvalor.net and she can help you out with that too. She's one of our mods and has been one of my YouTube friends since way back in the day when we were doing Wine Wednesday together over on Easy Computer Solutions channel talking about tech. Speaking of tech, I broke my freaking pop socket today and I'm so pissed about it. Like a, like disappointed like an eight-year-old like so mad. I have backup pop sockets, but my diamond D one broke. I'm gonna have to order a new one. But anyway. Okay. Okay. So, oh, tech, I know you're here. Will you put a link in the, um, thank you so much. I know you've got me. Will you put a link to your website in this? So you've got it for everybody. And, um, and away we go. We're going to jump into, we're going to jump into it. Oh, thank you, Trina. I appreciate it. Hi from Denmark. Um, Viking enthusiasts here are so upset with the shirtless guy from the photos of the Capitol. It's so weird, but it's a thing. And so many are angry here. I really appreciate that you brought this up before, before we jump into the Girardi. Um, I wondered if people would just be like, is that cultural appropriation? Is that an improper representation? And he was actually arrested a few nights ago, I talk about it in the podcast tomorrow. He was arrested a few nights ago here in the States. He has been in that outfit at rallies um, all over Arizona from the summer forward. So he has been in that garb quite a lot. I think for photographers, that is an easy, that is an easy target if you are one of the journalists on scene being because it just stands out so much. So um I'm I'm not surprised that people in our capital offended a worldwide audience as well as a US audience. I'm I'm not shocked. But I mean just not not shocked. There were so many tattoos. Um so not shocked. Not shocked. And know that we <laughs> don't attribute him to being um of you know, Swede, Norwegian, Denmark, Viking descent. I think I speak for a lot of the people I've talked, I can't talk to anyone. Most of us just thought he was a douche, like just dressed like an idiot because that's what he was going to do and didn't attribute any deeper meaning to all of the things. Adam McIntyre, good to see you. We were just talking about your video about my TED talk. <laughs> it's YouTube inception because um, you just encourage all of us for how thoughtful you are and and it is something so refreshing to see younger creators being very thoughtful and considered. And it's not something that all of us, you know, old bitches on YouTube get to see a ton. So we were talking about that. Thank you, Elizabeth, who said, I love watching your stream on my lunch break. The timing is always perfect. Perfect. Tech Valor shared um, her site. If you guys are YouTubers, my intros are done by Tech Valor go ahead and hit it up. She's one of our mods here. She's a YouTuber, content creator, and just an amazing human being. So we love supporting the mods. And Diva Views, um, no, Mila. Mila started her videos too. So Mila has some of her new videos up as well on the YouTubes. So our mods, our mods do all the things, you guys. Diva Mods, other channels, our mods are just, our mods are just fantastic. We love them so much. All right. It, the Buffalo. Yes, that was it. Um, glowy Nikki. Thanks for letting me bug you, uh, to add me on Pogo. You're the best. And I'm glad you're in this space. Glowy Nikki. Thank you so much. And I'm glad we're Pogo buddies. So I appreciate that. Um, this is a great question, Melina. Thank you for asking. Did I get diagnosed dyslexic in grade school? No, I did not get diagnosed until, I was in high school when I was also struggling with ADHD. And when I got diagnosed with ADHD, I, in the early nineties, it seemed that girls weren't evaluated as frequently for those types of things. Um, and so it was a hard thing. And there's also a lot of like shame and emotion around going to get diagnosed. And I think for my parents too, not wanting to have any like stigma on me, but it was clear that I was struggling and 
I'm glad that I understand myself better. And I think there's a lot less stigma around learning disabilities now. And I hope that that continues. But even my youngest still deals with it. Um, he's still not since we've moved, but also COVID. So he hasn't been at school, but he got made fun of for being in um, special ed support with his dyslexia and ADHD. So it's it still is hard. But as you get older, like kids don't get it. But as you get older, there's just definitely not as much. I don't experience as much stigma around it. But also, I'm very comfortable with like, hey, I think differently. Sometimes I get shit wrong. Sometimes I read shit out loud wrong. Um, math is hard because numbers move. Where my youngest actually does math problems from right to left instead of left to right. So we are now working with him to kind of help him learn to switch the way he does things. Cause even with his reading, he tries to read from the wrong direction. It's a very, very interesting. So we get to learn all together. All right. Thank you guys so, so much. I appreciate it. Um, I have not seen Jessica McCabe from how to ADHD. I've seen a lot of content lately from Shailene Johnson on ADHD, and we've definitely talked about it on this channel. So, and I know, um, Lori, who is a supporter of our channel and in here in the chat, um, specializes in that as well. So, all right. All right. We're going to dance. I'm like, dun, 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 dun. we're going to switch over to the Girardis. Thank you guys for all your questions in the chats. I'm going to pull up my notes. I have a chart. I haven't even had a chance to update the chart. There's a, I'm going to show you my chart real quick. There's a chart. Why is there a chart? Because there are that many cases. The bankruptcy cases aren't even on the chart yet. My chart of Girardi cases. And that's not even all of them because I haven't had a chance to update my chart. So when you guys are like, how do you keep this stuff straight? <laughs> I have a massive document of all of it and I have a chart. So if I'm going to do a back, we're going to do a background. We're going to do a background on it because there is a lot and then we're going to do an update. All right. Tom Girardi, big deal lawyer in Los Angeles has done famous cases, has done cases that have been covered in the media, has won like every award you can win as a plaintiff's attorney, meaning he represents people who have been injured in some way in civil cases generally. He has won billion dollar, billion with a B, billion dollar lawsuits. Okay. He won a $4.85 billion Vioxx lawsuit, a $1.9 billion California consumers lawsuit against the uh, natural gas companies in an antitrust case, a $1.7 billion judgment against El Paso gas. And so he covers cases that involve not only things like toxic torts, like the case in Aaron Brockovich, which is a toxic injury, either if it's in the water, in the environment, in a workplace that can cause cancer or other harms. He is dealing with the Lions Air cases, which are some of those Boeing um, uh, 737 MAX jet cases. He is dealing with um, a number of other large tort cases that are still ongoing. But this is a lawyer who has won when I say literally every award, like literally every award, he was the heads of different um, law associations, Dude's a big deal in the law space. His wife, second wife, I think there's only one prior divorce, but I could be wrong on that. His second wife is Erica Jane, Erica Girardi, real housewife of Beverly Hills. Um, musician? Because how many fucks do I... Look, the songs I enjoy. I can't with her right now with all of this, but the I, it's very hard for me to just not have the music in my head. So she is a Real Housewife of Beverly Hills. She, on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, she is famously over the top for how much money they have. They live in this massive Pasadena mansion. By the way, Pasadena, not in Beverly Hills. But most of the, it, not most, I can't say most, a number of the Housewives of Beverly Hills over the years have not actually lived in Beverly Hills proper. They live in 
uh, kind of offshoot communities. And I'm like, I wonder if the ones that actually live in Beverly Hills are like, y'all fuckers don't even live in Beverly Hills. Like you're not part of the Beverly Hills like scene, but whatever. Erica was a waitress at a pretty well-known um, restaurant in the in the Beverly Hills area where actors and like rich dudes like Tom hung out. That's how she met Tom, and that's how they um, that's how they got together. Hi there, thank you for the clarification. I felt like it might be a third wife, but I wasn't for sure, and I don't want to like put that out there. Yes, their house is actually that huge estate's actually a Pasadena house, which is not surprising because Pasadena has some of the old money large estates, and they have a pretty large estate. So, Real Housewife of Beverly Hills. Then, then, this Boeing case, the Lion Air crash, which was one of the Boeing crashes from two, three years ago, was settled as to some of the plaintiffs. So, there are two cases going on with regard to Boeing. There is the Boeing case with a with all of the surviving family members of the plane crash victims. No one sur- no one survived the plane crash. So there is a case against Boeing with all of the family members from the Lions Air crash that is in the District Court of Illinois. That case, different parts of it have settled. So there are lots of attorneys and different parts of the case have settled. Girardi's plaintiffs settled, but they also had local counsel. So the Girardi Keese firm is a California firm. He's a California barred attorney, as am I. But the case was in the federal court in Illinois. So there is a local Illinois law firm that is also involved in settling these cases. That law firm is Edelman PC. So that firm brought suit against Girardi Keese also in federal court in Illinois saying, Hey, um, I think I said Edelman Edelson. Y'all know what I mean. They sued saying, um, we settled these cases, but we have not seen an accounting that the family members we settled the cases for had been paid. And we have been trying to track this down, figuring out if they've been paid. We've been getting evasive answers. And now we don't know if the clients in this case have been paid. And the judge took that case on a um, immediate hearing. And there was an order to show cause because the reason this was moving so fast is because the other Boeing case had been staying the settlements. So that Boeing case was filed so that the different parts of it can settle. And the judge on the Boeing is on the Boeing case is also on this Edelson PC case. And the judge was like, y'all said it was settled. WTF, where's the money? Where's the money? Where is the money? And Edelson PC said, who you would really like to know that too, because the Girardi Keese firm had all of the interaction with the family members who survived. Now this gets more complicated because this crash was in Indonesia. There are language and time barriers. The conversations between the attorneys and the family members are done through translator. So there are some logistical things, which is why I think there was some time given from the time that this settled to the time that we're at now. But at all PC was like, why isn't there, why isn't there just, why isn't there an accounting of where the money went? Because here's how that normally goes. When you're in a civil settlement like this, Boeing paid Edel, not Edelson, Girardi Keys, the settlement that they agreed on. Then it should happen that the accounting is done on all the money that comes in, the hard costs are paid, the attorney percentage are paid or at least made note of like, this is how much we're paying in hard costs. This is how much we're paying to the attorneys for their percentage. And then you pay the clients and their money gets sent out. It It's not hard because as the case is going, we should know how much costs are. And once it's settled, costs have stopped. So it shouldn't be hard to be like, costs have stopped. This is where we're at because that should be tracked throughout the whole case. And then 
costs are this, the attorney portion is this, so you get this. Never done, it seems, in this case. Because Edelson PC is like, we've been asking since July. This settled in February, WTF. So now we're coming up, now we're sitting here mid-January going, this is almost a year from when this case settled and the plaintiffs haven't been paid. Huge fucking problem. And then when Edelson PC brought this into federal court, it hit the papers. I don't know why it hit the newspapers the way that it did, but it there's definitely tea in that suit. And I break it down. There's videos on the channel breaking it down. There's definitely like, oh, damn. I don't know if, if I don't know how it got picked up. I imagine it got picked up. Speculation. I imagine it got picked up because Erica had filed for divorce right before this happened. And so the divorce was in the newspaper. And then the Edelson PC lawsuit alleges that the divorce is a sham divorce to hide money. So I think that's why this got picked up with that. Cause it was like, when you read it, you're like, damn, damn. Now, again, these are allegations, but what we know from the court documents and the hearings that have happened between this all breaking and now is that um totally lost my train of thought Apolo literally something flew by outside my window and it was very big and i was like in my brain that you can watch the add happen in real time in my brain i was like is that a hawk was it a buzzard <laughs> this is why when i do most of the breakdowns i pre-record them but um that lawsuit really laid out like hey hey this is a divorce that's a sham we're alleging that the money hasn't been paid we are including links to voicemails which i've played on this channel links to voicemails so there's a lot of information in that suit with these allegations. Now, with regard to those allegations, the court held the order to show cause with regard to why the fuck haven't you been paid? Order to show cause. Why the fuck haven't you paid the clients? And the lawyers for Tom Girardi were like, hmm? uh, we don't have any money. I'm, what? You don't, what? And the federal judge was like, I'm sorry. What? What do you, what do you mean you don't have any money? You look, your your wife is up on the TV talking about spending forty thousand dollars a month on glam. What, what? And then the lawyers said, then the lawyers said in the first OSC hearing, um, the firm has about fifteen thousand dollars in operating expenses, and the judge was like the fuck you did not just say that this is uh, emily's emily's recreation for the law nerds of what happened that has been reported in this federal hearing so then the judge was like nah we're freezing your assets until you figure this out pay the fucking people pay the fucking people why can't you pay the people pay the people pay, it's not that much money pay the people and it's not that much money because in the scope of the settlement from Boeing, which the judge knows, we don't know how much exactly that settlement is. It's protected so far. Perfect. But the judge was like, look, you, the judge knows because the judge knows what was in that settlement because he's on both cases. So the judge is aware. And he was like, um, how did you not just pay them? Like the money shouldn't be gone. You have no right to spend client money anywhere. And I see the questions OSC. I'm sorry. Sometimes I forget that I uh, do that in other conversations, order to show cause. The order to show cause is a motion that you can bring before the court saying, we need to know what the fuck is happening. So you can get order to show causes for different things. And the order to show cause in this case was contempt because the court had approved the settlement and then the clients hadn't been paid. So the judge in the federal case in Illinois said, we're freezing all your fucking assets. What in the hell? what, what is happening? We're freezing your assets. No, that was the first asset freeze. Then Erica Jane went on Twitter and was using that French, like Poshmarky type thing to sell clothes. And it was all up on her Twitter. And so then it went back into court 
what does this sound like? Back into court based on social media behavior. And Edel Simpson, he was like, she's selling her, your honor, <laughs> your honor. She's selling her Gucci on Twitter. Where is the money going? We need the money for the for our plaintiffs. Your honor, make her stop selling her shit. So it was essentially a motion to not sell your shit. But it was in order to show cause regarding contempt, regarding the asset freeze. Your honor, make her stop selling her Gucci on the internet. And the judge was like, um, yeah, that's probably all community property. Stop selling your shit on the internet. Because if it's community property, they have filed for divorce but are still married. Community property is anything that you buy during marriage. They've been married, what, 18 years? So yeah, last season's Gucci is going to be community property. And the judge is like, no, 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 no. So that is what kind of ran up in the federal case. There is, we can't sell your shit. There is an asset freeze. That's the federal case. While that was happening, creditors in Los Angeles courts were coming out of the walls, filing other cases saying, what, what, we haven't been paid either. What is happening? What is happening? So the Girardi business partners, ex-business partner, Keith, sued in two different cases. Wells Fargo sued. And then other lenders sued. Those lenders are people who front the money essentially for the civil lawsuits. So Tom Girardi and Girardi Keese seem to take most of their cases on uh, contingency. What a attorney contingency is, is that you as the client aren't fronting the money. So they are saying, okay, we will cover the costs of getting this case to litigation litigation. We will cover the cost of depositions. We will cover all these costs for you. And then we, when we get a settlement, we will take our costs. Then we will take our fee, which is generally 33 to 40% costs, then fee, then you get what's left. So that's how a contingency works. Costs. And when you look at some of these contingency arrangements, it's like, you know, it's 10 cents a page for printing out documents. It's a $250 an hour per each attorney for, well, no, it's Jordy Keys, probably $450 an hour for each attorney for depositions, plus the court reporter, plus this. So there are lenders that front that money to attorneys that work on contingency like this. In one of the many legal documents in this case, the lender said, you know, sometimes we can lend two, $3 million for a lawsuit to get it off the ground. And in other legal documents, Tom Girardi said it can cost $10 million in some of these cases to prep them. But also if you see a case with a $4 billion settlement, a $10 million um, buy-in to investigate it doesn't sound outrageous. But at some point also for me, it's like monopoly money. It's like, oh, oh okay, it's just $4 billion. Like what uh, numbers don't even mean real things anymore because of the amount of money they put out. So so that's where we're at with that. So the, the law firm lenders have come out of the woodwork. The business partners sued in two cases. Then it has come out that the property that the firm owns has other liens on it. So there are other encumbrances because it looks like the equity was pulled out of the business location and there's a lender on it. That's regarding one of the... <laughs> one of the business partner lawsuits or the former business partner. I see I'm saying business partner because it's stuck in my head from the Toddy Westbrook cases, but the law firm partner Keese who had left sued twice. I hadn't gotten paid and I hadn't, um, and I have this agreement over the property and now there's these liens on the property that aren't supposed to be there. So it looks like the business location doesn't have any equity left in it. Then people were digging into their private residence. I did not do that because I know because that's not what we do up in here. We read court documents. But people did dig into their home and found that there were liens on the home as well. So now it looks like even if they sell the home, there are liens on the large Pasadena property as well. So there might not be a ton of money there. So it's going to come down to what can be sold. Like the Panther ring that we all saw, how much is that worth? Can we sell it? 
Um, I talked about it each time I talk about this. I talk about the clip from, um, oh, Pretty Little Lies. Not Pretty Little Lies. I'm going to blank on the name. But, you know, the one with Reese Witherspoon and everybody. Uh, there was a book that was a great book. You guys will tell me in the chat and we'll get back to it. But there's a, a clip of one of the Renata going through bankruptcy and like taking off her rings and being like, here it is. And they're like, that's not listed for bankruptcy. That's not listed for bankruptcy. The bankruptcy court has the right to take property and sell it off. The bankruptcy trustees can also big little lies. Thank you guys. I loved big little lies. See, this is why I get pretty little lies confused. I transpose things in my head. It was fantastic. There's a whole scene. <laughs> so what happened here, because I've jumped into bankruptcy, what happened here is that a number of the creditors all got together. That sounds so nefarious. Their lawyers were like this. We're never getting paid. We have to go into bankruptcy. So the attorneys for the creditors filed for an involuntary bankruptcy in California saying, um, this is not going to go well. There are too many creditors. There are too many judgments because right now the judgments I have, and there, are, it looks like our others in Arizona, the judgments that I have pulled myself are a $6 million judgment owed to law finance group, a $11 million judgment owed to other plaintiffs that weren't paid in the Rigo Gomez case, Rui Gomez case, a $5.8 million judgment owned, owed to Stillwell Madsen. There's another Stillwell Madsen case. That is one of these lenders that lends money. So is Law Finance Group. And so is KCC Class Action Services. And there's a $7.5 million judgment owned to KCC Class Action Services. Um, those are the initial judgments owed. This is not even judgments coming down the road. Wells Fargo has sued for over $800,000. Uh, Keese, the business partner, has sued for over $500,000. Keese and the business group that owns the property sued for $7.4 million. There is a personal security that's like, you owe us $53,000. Sorry, security group. I hope that's a perfected loan. So a number of these creditors got together and were like, um, we need to put this in bankruptcy court. The reason they want to put it in bankruptcy court, because if it's in bankruptcy, it goes under this umbrella of bankruptcy court and the bankruptcy court takes control of selling off all of the shit and doling out the money. It's, it's like when mom's handing out your allowance. That's a really crude example of bankruptcy, but it works. They will take in everything they can find sell it and try to get these people paid. There are now motions in the federal court in Illinois regarding the other law firm partners. Well, here's the thing. Girardi and the other two partners, Lyra and Griffin, Lyra and Griffin said, Girardi's in charge of everything. We had no control of anything. We told him this was a bad idea, but we don't have control. The newest motion that's filed, which I will go line by line and break down, and we don't have time to do up in here today because we're doing a breakdown. But Lyra, who's his son-in-law, and Griffin, who looks like he's been with the firm for quite a while, have said, look, we didn't have control. There's a new motion from Edelson PC, a new declaration saying they were signers. They were signers on the accounts. So now the son-in-law did have control over the accounts, which means it's going to loop in these other attorneys because if they had signer access to the client accounts that are supposed to pay out these settlements, then they had control over the accounts. Why the fuck didn't they do it is what the court's asking. Okay, great. He wasn't doing it. You still have a duty as an attorney. You still have a duty to your clients and you still have a duty to the court. Why didn't you pay the money, bro? So that is all going to come up too. that these other attorneys, one of them being his son-in-law and the son-in-law we talked about last week, the week before so much has happened in this world in the last two weeks. I think the week before that the son-in-law has now stepped away from his other firm and the firm like scrubbed him off the website. It was like, you went to his name and it was like 404 error, like does not exist. 
So there is more to come with regard to the son-in-law. There is more to come with regard to this attorney Griffin. They both moved to other places. Um, while this was all going down over the summer, it looks like everybody has tried to jump ship from Tom Girardi, including Erica Jane. She's like, I'm filing for divorce. The other um, attorneys were like, we're leaving. We're going to, the, the rats running from the Titanic is what it feels like. But there are, every day it feels like there are more of these cases and creditors popping up. So this is all going to go into bankruptcy court. The federal filing from Edelson PC alleges, and it is alleged in one other court filing as well, which is where it looks like they pulled it from, alleges that Erica Jane's company, um, EJ Creative, got a $20 million loan from Girardi Keys, the law firm. Well, here's the thing. In the bankruptcy right now, there is a bankruptcy that has been granted. So they're in bankruptcy. Temporary trustees have been granted. One for Girardi Keys, the law firm, <clears throat> one for Tom Girardi, the person. But the bankruptcy trustees are allowed to sue people for their money. So if the law firm did in fact lend Erica Jane's company, EJ Creative, $20 million, the bankruptcy trustees' attorneys are allowed to sue EJ Creative to get back the $20 million. Like, hey, you haven't paid us. This money needs to go elsewhere. Your loan is being called. Pay us. So right now, Erica is not in the bankruptcy herself yet. But when it comes to Tom Girardi personally, all of the community property assets can come into the bankruptcy. Erica's car, Erica's jewelry, all of that. Now, if Erica purchased those things with, we should just call her EJ, because we've gone with two letter abbreviations for everyone, and that's fair. If EJ purchased those through her company, which not unheard of to, to purchase a car through a company, to purchase jewelry you'd wear on stage through a company. I mean, mine all comes from Amazon <laughs> for the earrings. Um, but we're not like running into, uh, into Cartier for like $500,000 rings up in here because I don't even think I'd be comfortable wearing that, honestly. But if she purchased those through the company, though, I do think she said on the show that it was a gift from Tom, but you never know. A gift from Tom might be the gift of him not giving you shit when you've spent that much money on jewelry. Either way, EJ might have purchased those things through her business, but her business can still be sued in the bankruptcy court if that $20 million loan was in fact a $20 million loan because the bankruptcy trustees are allowed to try to claw back money, literally what it's called. It's it's it, the mental image of clawing back money. That's what the bankruptcy court is trying to do, to claw back money to pay the people who are owed the money. And they get to set a reasonable cost of living. The bankruptcy court gets to decide this is how much you get for um, monthly living expenses. This is how much you get for housing. And the divorce is going to get hung up in all of this too, because there's still a divorce being filed. So we can't settle and split the property and the divorce until the bankruptcy is done because the community property has to come first because the community property is going to go to pay the people. Y'all, there's so much fuckery in this case. It is so much fuckery in this case. It's crazy. So Brianna Gonzalez um, absolutely caught my eye. Can they still sue it even if it's paid back? No. No. If it's been paid back to the firm, no, they can't sue her to get money back unless there are other loans. This would only be assuming those loans are still outstanding. So the conversation will be now, is there money elsewhere? What are the bounds of the bankruptcy court? Where can they try to find the money? And it's not just money, it's money and property that can be sold. So if you've got a Birkin, like bye-bye Birkin, mm -hmm. see you, that's going to get sold. And I wonder if the bankruptcy lawyers, like bankruptcy lawyers, look, look. 
So I did a case with a celebrity when I was a DA. Oh, DA story time. We need lip gloss for a quick DA story time. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to lippy it up. This again is on my Instagram from Jen Gerard. Thank you, Jen. We're going to lippy it up. All right. Personal property. So I had, when I worked at the courthouse that covers Beverly Hills, covers um, Westwood, covers all of the kind of bouge areas right around there, I had a celebrity case where a personal assistant stole a lot of personal property from said celebrity when she was out at like fan conventions and stuff. So she would travel and then bits of her jewelry would go missing. Some of the jewelry was sentimental. Some of the jewelry was jewelry she had worn in famous photos or on the red carpet. And that was being sold for more because she had um, worn it. So she hired a private investigator and they started trying to find this on the interwebs. Like, hey, where is my jewelry? Because if somebody stole it from you, they're going to sell it saying this person wore this jewelry. And and we're doing that. We're selling it all over the place and kind of through a third party. So it looks like the assistant person had taken the stuff, s- verified where it came from, sent it to a resell individual, and that person was shopping it around, but was asking for significantly more money for it because it had been worn by this individual. So it had more value than just the cost of the jewelry because it was worn by the celebrity. I hope that the bankruptcy court does that in this case saying, well, I don't know. I don't know if the reputational value will be there, but like, hey, this was worn um, by EJ on this episode of Real Housewives. This was carried by this. I hope there is enough reputational value in there to sell these things off at a good enough price to actually get the money back, particularly for the clients that haven't been paid. There are allegations that this has happened in over um, over tens, twenties cases. That made no sense. The words just, there's an article from the Daily Breeze. It's linked in my other videos that alleges like 22 cases against Tom Girardi. Again, the California bar has never disciplined him per the California bar's website. I have questions. I have so many questions. Because this, look, fucking with client funds is the fastest track to get your ass disbarred. And I don't know why that's happened. Though I have some, I have I have some suppositions um, and I will pull up Twitter in a second and go through my suppositions. So I hope that the lawyers and the bankruptcy trustees use whatever reputational clout is left to sell these for more so that you can get them um, paid back to the clients. Now, bankruptcy is also going to have to sort because there's the personal side and the business side. There are two bankruptcy trustees. So they're going to have to sort what the law firm owes, what Tom owes personally, where the money is, where the assets are. We are not going to be done with this. And someone else in court, and I don't remember if it was the bankruptcy trustee for which case, because there's the two, the firm and the individual, said this was the tip of the iceberg. And I'm like, your girl's been saying that for at least a month, because fuck, there is so much here. And I want to know why the bar didn't do shit. I have questions. If anyone from the state bar is a fan, we can talk off the record. Just email me. I am fascinated to know how this all went down, because I don't know the inner workings of the state bar. Um, so there is another attorney that has been following this pretty closely on the Twitters, um, because what better attorney advertising is there than timing out other attorneys? I am horrified and fascinated by this case and I am not the only one. So this other attorney pulled a number of documents and I'm going to pull up one of the, they dug into stuff that I'm not going to dig into. So I will share what they've dug up, but I'm not there's stuff that we're just not doing. Um, A, they've alleged, let me just pull it up. It has been alleged that the Girardis have not paid their property taxes. Now, I don't know how they tied back the address to the property case, um, but the this is what they are alleging 
has not been paid because it's showing it has not been paid as of December 10th. This was pulled after December 10th. So we're now 32,000 back on property taxes, which can we just talk about the property taxes, but there's already a penalty on here, which does indicate to me, well, no, this was pulled after the 10th. So that would have been the penalty for failing to pay on the 10th. And then there is a second installment due of almost $30,000 again in, in April. So there's now this allegation out there that property taxes have not been paid. So it's starting to look like the Girardis are not paying anything. And then uh, Mr. Richards pulled up political contributions and pulled up the amount of political contributions, a total of almost a million dollars in political donations. Now, is this why, is this why this has not been dug into? I, I would love to know what you think. Let's look at who these donations are to. Is this why, is this why, is this why the state bar is not doing shit? I'm curious. I'm not saying they are. I'm saying I'm curious. So, uh, Anna Maria Quintero for, for Senate, Gavin Newsom for governor, $30,000, Dave Jones, Dave Jones for attorney general. I don't know why that shows a negative. I have questions. Another Gavin Newsom for governor, another almost $30,000. Um, Jeff Blech, I don't know how to pronounce that at all. For Lieutenant Governor, 2018, $7,000. Bracera for Attorney General, $7,000. Wendy Carrillo for Assembly, $4,000. Consumer Attorneys of California Political Action Committee, $5,000. There's another one for Bracera. Um, there were more. Dave Jones for Attorney General, 2018. Oh, that's the same one. So we're getting down at the bottom. Uh, this was the last one we pulled up for Sarah. So Dave Jones for attorney general, 2018, Kevin De Leon for Senate, 2014, Dave Jones for insurance commissioner, Matt Gatto for assembly, Bob was shot. We're not even going to try for Senate 2014. So these are pulling all the way back into 2014. I imagine these are all of them that were not through the business. Cause it looks like these were pulled up from, um, Tom Girardi and not Girardi Keese because some businesses can donate politically. So I don't know. I don't know how much the connections to the different bar associations. I don't know. I don't know how much the connections to these politicians um, affected those decisions. I don't know. I've got questions, but we've got now a hundred Oh no, almost a million dollars in political donations. But where's the money? But where's the money? But with billions, they have multiple billion dollar settlements. A million dollars in political donations shouldn't be a big deal with the amount of money they should have. So where is the money? Where is the money is going to be the TV movie on all of this. The where is the money is where the Netflix drama is. Somebody needs to be investigating this already other than us just talking about it. Like the where is the money Netflix series? Questions, questions, questions. But yes, they are, they are, Dinner's Ready was like they're connected. They are big, big connected within uh, California. But the state bar shouldn't be able to be bought. I'm not saying that happened. I'm curious the state bar should be independent of those things because the state bar disciplines lawyers. But big lawyers will say things like, do you know who I am? Okay, go ahead and sue me. Cute. So this is concerning. I think that there is, I think that there, there, the money has to be somewhere. It's not just in planes and it's not just in jewelry. It's got to be somewhere. So, I know that the bankruptcy trustees probably feel the same way that I do. And the bankruptcy trustees are like, where's the money? That's what I want to see. So there were a few other things brought up on this Twitter. Again, if you want to follow it, it's Ronald Richards. He is definitely pulling up a few different cases. He's cycling. He's following the um, Aventi stuff and a few other things, but always 
the housewife stuff. So the Arizona district case, this is the Stillwell Madsen has cases in Los Angeles and Arizona. And Erica is named in this case too. So EJ's in this one as well. They are pausing this case to see what happens in the bankruptcy case. Not surprised. Um, and then this, nope. There was this, there was one more I wanted to pull up with regard to the son-in-law signing and being a signer on the cases because this is new information from the new contempt filings, the filings that I'm going to pull up. But the son-in-law, David Lira, and then Keith Griffin are both signers on the client trust accounts. And so these purport to show from these court documents that client trust accounts were signed and that there was a client trust account because you guys will um, will remember me saying, was there not a client trust account? Like WTF is happening. So I will pull up this latest one and do a sit down breakdown of the latest filings from Edelson PC. Edelson PC is not fucking around. Edelson PC is, they seem to be as pissed as I am with like, this is, this is so beyond unacceptable. There aren't even words for the fuckery. Like fuckery is not even a strong enough word for the fuckery. People have already been injured in this. It, it, trusted an attorney with a good reputation to our knowledge at the time with their money, with their pain, with their case. And this attorney was like, cute. How many fucks do I give? And then the money is apparently gone. It's horrifying. And it's something that I'm just like, we are not, I'm not done with this ever. I'm never going to be done with this case until we see what happens at the end because I'm angry about it. And there are so many cases, but clients shouldn't have to ever turn around and sue their attorney to get the money that's entitled to them ever, ever, ever. Um, so I'm going to answer a few questions and then we'll move on to other topics. Um, question, could this be an elaborate plot to hide money from Erica as well? And the clients were collateral damage. Jana, I don't know. And Jana Martin, Jana Martin, Jana Martin, Jana Martin, we know each other like people because I know a Jana Martin. Hi. Um, I don't think so. I, because the professional reputational consequences are too big. It just feels like the money somewhere there was a tipping point and the money got behind. Like we needed the next recovery to pay out the last one. Something tipped it where the money wasn't coming in. And the Daily Breeze article alleges lawsuits back into the 90s before he and EJ met. So you guys, I don't know. I don't know what the tipping point was that moved this into like, hey... Why isn't this getting paid? I really don't know. So I'm going to try to catch up on a couple questions. I really don't think it's trying to hide the money from her because I think this predates it. So I absolutely think it predates it. So Annie J said, spend money on private jets, real, private jets, real estate, dining out. I remember they had houses everywhere. Erica couldn't keep up on the show. Well, hopefully those on are all mortgaged to the balls and those will get sold off by the bankruptcy trustees. So the money has to be somewhere. Matthew, I agree. There should be billions. There is a $4 billion settlement and they would have gotten costs on that and fees on that. I mean, what the fuck's 30% of 4 billion? I'm going to go with a lot. <laughs> like the fact that the money is gone is shocking. It's got to be somewhere. I hope the bankruptcy trustees take glee in trying to track this money down when <laughs> When I got to do cases that involved bank records and stuff like that as a DA, there was always a little bit of like curiosity and like, I will find it that once you get into like investigative mode, you're like, I will find this money. And I know that the detectives don't have all the time in the world. We're going to do this together. I will sit here and go through bankrupt records forever to try to track down what happened here because bank records don't lie. Like you can find what happened in documents. And that's why I really loved document-based cases. I see that we have over 4,600 law nerds in here. Will you guys let me know how many likes are on the video so we can go ahead and like the video so we can, we can, 
algorithm this shit up and do the YouTube things because I'm ready for purple hair. Like I, I maybe purple highlights where we can just like let the purple go all the way through the bun. It'll be fun. Question. Will these candidates have to pay those back to the bankruptcy or victims? No, they won't tickled pink They're Once again, they don't, the money's some of those things are from 2014 and later, but there's no cause to claw back money, money that wasn't lent. So money that was spent is harder to get back. Cause you can't really, you can't, <laughs> I was going to say, you can't really sell Newsom back. I'm sure some want to, but you can't really sell back a politician. You can sell a jet, a ring, a car, Gucci shoes, Chanel bags, Birkin, whatever you can sell tangible goods, but money like that, you cannot get back. So there it is. Um, I'm going to try to get a few more questions before we move on. Um, are, am I going to be covering the new WhatsApp terms and conditions at some point? Not today, though. I think I will put it on the list um, for Friday when we get into, I don't know if any more is going to happen with the parlor lawsuit, but as we get into talking about social media and talking about uh, social media terms and privacy and all that stuff, then I will get into it for sure. So let's see what else. I am trying to find a few more. And then I agree. Hi there. It isn't adding up at all. So question, could his connection to Trisha Bigelow have something to do with his not being disciplined? That's a fantastic question. I don't. And for those of you that are like, what's a Trisha Bigelow? Trisha Bigelow is a judge that was doxxed by EJ that had had a previous relationship with Tom Girardi seemingly before Judge Bigelow got married, but not, um, but while Tom and Erica during the course of their marriage, but it seems to be a number of years ago. But I don't know if she has a role on the state bar. She's a federal judge, but the state bar is generally run by um, attorneys and the state bar also has boards. I don't know if she was a part of any of those things. I'm sure if she was, the Twitter sleuths would have determined it, but I have not looked, but I will because it's like, maybe, but I don't know. I, I guess it's, it's optimistic of me to be like, I would hope people would just do the right thing. Um, and call this out because at the end of the day, plaintiffs are the ones getting hurt. Ugh. So yes, Tina Corley, always follow the money for everything. Follow the money for everything. Follow the money and you will, uh, you will find it. So let me see what I agree. I agree. I agree. The money's gotta be somewhere. Let me, I see a few super chats that came in. Let me try to get to those and then we're going to switch topics. I can't, ah, my thing jumped and I lost them. I am sorry to the super chats that I just lost. I apologize. Thank you guys for letting me know. Go ahead and give this a thumbs up. And then at the end, I'll remind you again. Um, thank you. Thank you, Taryn. You're the type of lawyer I hope to be. I appreciate that. I pulled that up. Um, <clears throat> Louisa, can't wait till payday to join your channel. Oh, thank you. Look, I always do most of my content available to everyone. Channel members do get stuff early. Sometimes it's not super early because I'm literally editing until it goes up, but channel members do get stuff early and get to give input for stuff. So thank you for that. Um, love your content. My ADD ask can focus on it. Thank you. And then Melissa Kay said, this is why I'm going to work with a CHP 13, uh, chapter 13 trustee. Too much BS. And I already see a lot. I are glad to work for a, a chapter 13 trustee. Yeah. The, this chapter seven forced stuff is bananas. Like the, the Girardi stuff is absolutely bananas to me. Um, question. Does Bravo have to send footage as evidence? It depends on what is requested and what they have. I can imagine some of her statements are exaggerated on that show. And that's another thing. But could I see them saying, hey, do you have clips of her closet so that they can, the bankruptcy trustee can try to track back to what was there and what she had and at what time she had it? Maybe. Um, I could absolutely see that being requested. So AR, thank you. You remind me of my best friend. I haven't seen her in a year. Thanks so much. <laughs> So if you guys are, I saw a couple of people saying that they had gotten a little blurred, try to refresh it. Sometimes it happens with the streams um, on YouTube. And if you refresh it, especially as we're at almost 5,000 people, um, refresh it on your end and it should help. 
Okay. Okay. Palette cleanser. We're going to talk about here. We're going to, we're going to make sure we're not having sticky lips. <laughs> They're not, but I get, when you talk too long, I get gunk, get gunk. Oh, I didn't even bring this up in my, in my coverage. Can EJ face jail time if convicted in the criminal case? The criminal case is under investigation, but depending on what they charge, it is possible. So yes, it is possible, but we're definitely not done. All right. All right. All right. Topic change, topic change. There is a new Saltsy filing. I'm going to do a much faster breakdown of that case because there's not as much updates. I want to make sure I'm going to look at my notes. I'm not time stamping the topic change yet because I want to make sure I swept everything. So where we stand, I feel like I didn't close the loop on where we stand with the Girardi case. Where we stand with the Girardi case is there are two temporary bankruptcy trustees appointed. Other cases are being pulled into the bankruptcy. Assets are frozen because the bankruptcy trustees are involved and are going to tell them how they're allowed to spend their money or not. The divorce is going to come behind the bankruptcy, and there are still contempt hearings pending for the other lawyers from the Girardi Keys firm in the Illinois case, and that kind of summarizes where we're at. No one, it seems, has seen Tom Girardi in public, and Erica Jane is still posting really tone-deaf shit on Instagram, which is, uh, it's just hard to watch. So that's the summary of where we're at with the Girardi Keys case. Let's move on to Toddy Westbrook's defamation case because the filings just don't stop in this case. Just to be clear, Toddy Westbrook has two active cases. One of them, she is being sued by their business partner, they being her, her husband, and Halo, Clark Swanson. That's the business partner case. Then after the business partner case was um, filed, the my brain just stopped. The Westbrooks filed a defamation lawsuit against YouTube channel without a crystal ball and its proprietor, you know, personality, KJ. In that defamation case, the defamation case was filed. Shenanigans happened on social media. Then a motion to not delete your shit was filed. It's really a motion to preserve evidence. We've all got nicknames for everything up here. So motion to not delete your shit was filed. The motion to not delete your shit was resolved by stipulation of the parties, meaning the attorneys came together and said, yes, we agree. This is what will or will not be deleted. Well, not will or will not. This is what will not be deleted, which is, you know, most of the shit. So that was resolved. Motion to not delete your shit resolved by stipulation. So now we've got the complaint for defamation, alleging statements in over 40 videos, a Patheos, Patheos article and tweets and shit. Then the defense responded, the defense being KJ and her channel responded in civil litigation. You can respond with litigation shit or answer shit. Answer is like, hey, yeah, cute. We didn't do the shit that you said we did. And these are our defenses. Litigation shit is like, hey, you don't have jurisdiction over us. Hey, you didn't service properly. And there can be some other types of pre-litigation before you answer. Or it can be a stay to answer, which is what's happening in the Boeing case. Like, we're not going to answer the lawsuit because we're in settlement negotiations and we expect these to take a long time. So yes, there's still a lawsuit filed. We're not answering the lawsuit yet because we're still trying to resolve all the cases. That's what's happening in that underlying Boeing case in the Girardi cases. In this case, KJ's team filed a motion to dismiss. The Really, the heart of that motion to dismiss is jurisdictional issues saying, hey, um, person and business are residents in not Washington, in Minnesota. So you in Washington do not have jurisdiction. You cannot call them in and lord over them in court because they do not have enough contacts with the state of Washington to make it right, essentially, that the Washington court would have jurisdiction over them. So they filed a motion to dismiss largely based on jurisdiction. We've talked about the motion to dismiss. The motion to dismiss is the one that like brings in PewDiePie and Keemstar and Trisha Paytas and is written like a, I called it a fruit salad mixed in a blender. It is a, it is a hard to parse motion to dismiss. I didn't like it. It's on 45 line paper. It's annoying. That's the motion to dismiss. Then Toddy Westbrook's side filed a response to the motion to dismiss, which is their opposition to the motion to dismiss. Then 
KJ side filed a reply to the opposition to the motion to dismiss. So this is law in motion practice. You're watching it happen day by day. This is law in motion, actually in motion. Motion to dismiss, opposition, reply. Wherefore comes now the motion for leave for sir reply. The sir reply is a very narrow scope of a reply saying, hey, by the way, your honor, there's some shit in the other motion that's new. New shit's not supposed to be in a reply. Strike the new shit. So as I say, every time we get into this, every time we talk about KJ, yes, there is Twitter shenanigans. Yes, she has come for me on Twitter. We are still not talking about her as a human. We are not judging. We are not disparaging. We are not trying to figure out what she is thinking. We do not know. We are reading legal documents and we are leaving it alone. We are not speculating on why or how or what, because y'all, we don't know. Don't know. Not going to try to know. Aren't going to try to figure it out. Don't know. So we are not and I appreciate the chat you guys have been saying. You guys have been amazing with keeping it classy. We are not here to talk about people in that way. We're here to talk about, well, lawyers. We'll talk about lawyers. And we're here to talk about the cases and the things that are filed. Okay. So we're going to talk about sassy footnotes. And then we will talk about some stuff that Salty posted on Twitter, which indicates to me, again, that there are more motions coming. So because, you know, I will just... For all of you new, there's almost 5,000 of us in the chat. For those of you that don't know, before I became a district attorney, I was a civil research attorney for two judges in the Los Angeles Superior Court. What that means I did was that when this kind of law in motion happened before it went to the judge, I read it all. I researched the law on it all. And then I briefed it for the judge saying, this side saying this, this side saying this, this is where the law is. Here's kind of how I think. And then sitting down with the judge and sometimes helping the judges write motions, sometimes, oftentimes, helping the judges write their rulings, helping ask for clarity, reaching out to the attorneys and being like, no, no, this is over the page limit and I'm not reading that shit. Like I'm way too busy for your bullshit today. Reaching out to the attorneys and saying, we need you. I didn't say it that way. We need you to go ahead and follow the court's order and it needs to be within the page limits. So when I'm talking about law and motion like this, this is what I did for a job. So this was, when I say I love a sassy footnote, this harkens back to my days working with judges going, but a sassy footnote kind of made my day. And you knew when you saw attorneys regularly who wrote in a really clear way and who didn't. And even though it doesn't change your ruling, like somebody can write a great motion and still be wrong on the way that the law comes out because their side just isn't going to be the way that the law falls, but it's still easier to write. And so it makes it easier to parse. And you're just like, ah, oh, I appreciate the clear writing. So I worked as a civil research attorney before I became a district attorney. And then I worked with businesses doing business law. So this is what we're doing. All right, let's just pull it up. It's not even highlighted because I didn't save the highlighted one onto my computer before my live because yesterday took literally all of my energy to uh, do the podcast. So the sir reply is going to be short. The sir reply is filed by, uh, by, Toddy Westbrook's side. So this is going to be a salty filing. You'll always know which side's filing it by A, the lack of 45 line paper. Yes, it's shade. The lack of 45 line paper and the fact that this is filed by Salty's firm. Didn't I pull this up? Because I've got it on the, uh, there we go. That's easier for me to read here. So I had it pulled up in two places. All right. Because if you guys haven't read these, I'm fucking raking, puts these in a Dropbox up on the Twitters. So if you want to read them for yourself, they're all on a Dropbox on the Twitters in a pinned comment. So you guys can go pull them up there if you would like. All right. Plaintiff's request for leave to file sir reply. The reason it's titled this is because the court has to approve approve. That's horrible. The court has to approve the sir reply, meaning it's not just a 
given that you get to file a sir reply? Because at some point, are you all like, when are we done? When are we done with filings? Like at some point, y'all have to stop replying to each other and the judge just has to rule. Right. That is why there is a leave for sir reply. They're asking the judge to allow this to be filed to do the things that they're asking. And what they're asking is to strike some of the new information. So plaintiffs, Tatiana Westbrook, James Westbrook, and Halo Beauty Partners LLC by and through their undersigned counsel hereby request this court for leave to file us a reply pursuant to local rules. This is what they're asking for. Um, pursuant to local rules and this court's standing order. Look, look, we've acknowledged that there's a standing order. A research attorney is going to be like, Thank you. Thank you. And when I say 45 line paper, if you haven't watched literally all of the other videos on this, it's totally fine. I get it. This is 45 line paper. Defendants keep filing on 45 line paper. I don't know why the standing order for the court says 26 line paper, 45 line paper just generally hurts the eyes. See how much more it's just, it's a breath of fresh air on the double space paper. This is single space paper, but then they double space the motion, which means the line numbers aren't going to match up. See how nine doesn't quite match up. You need the line numbers to match up. So when you cite them, they match up. But when you double space your motion and single space your line pages, it doesn't match up and it makes it hard. Things that annoy Emily. Look, from a former research attorney, follow the standing order to strike inadmissible hearsay statements and new evidence contained in paragraphs three, four, and five of the supplemental declaration of Catherine Paulson in support of defendant's reply in support of motion to dismiss. So they're saying, look, there's no foundation. And in evidence, there has to be foundation for the shit that you say. So there's no foundation for shit that was said in the supplemental declaration. So this is... Tati's side saying, hey, judge, this is new stuff and you can strike it because it doesn't have evidentiary foundation. And that's what they're going to get to. Is it a sassy footnote? Let's see. Oh, there's lots of footnotes. Consistent with local rule 7G, plaintiffs do not intend to strike the new arguments and new non-defamation case. Ooh, shade. There's lawyer shade. This is a first look, by the way y'all. We're doing a first look. Shade, new non-defamation case law relating to jurisdiction raised for the first time by defendants in their reply. However, plaintiffs do hereby reserve their objections to same for the record. <laughs> Yikes. Coming out. Look, these, these filings have come out hot on both sides. I'm here for it. There are shots fired both ways. But in a reply, okay, in your motion, your motion, whatever the motion is, in this case, motion to dismiss, your motion has all your arguments in it. So you look into your lawyer crystal ball, and I called it my lawyer crystal ball from the time I was a DA. It has nothing to do with the YouTube channel. But you look into your little lawyer seeing the future device, and you go, what are they probably going to argue? And then you try to head off those arguments and make your arguments in your motion. And then the other side responds and or opposes. And then when you respond, you say their opposition is dumb because this, this, and this. But you don't make new arguments. You just say, no, no, they're taking shots at my arguments and they're wrong and this is why they're wrong. You don't really say they're dumb. Like in lawyer languages, you say they're dumb. But that's how it goes. You put everything you've got, all your arguments in your motion. Then the other side says, you're wrong because of this. Then in the reply to the opposition, you say, no, no, you're misinterpreting it. These are my arguments. And then you double down on what you argued. What You don't bring in new case law, new arguments, and new stuff. But that was done here. So that's where the snark came from of just, we're just going to remind the court that plaintiffs do not intend to strike the new arguments. Your Honor, Remember, they added shit they shouldn't have. And new non-defamation case law, Your Honor, the case law they relied in in their reply isn't even regarding defamation cases. And isn't that what's here? 
relating to jurisdiction raised for the first time by defendants in their reply. Hey, Your Honor, it's new in their reply. That's what this footnote is. However, plaintiffs do hereby reserve their objections to the same for the record. Meaning, yeah, but they still can't do that. But we have more important shit to cover, and so replies are short. So we're not we're not going to go for everything. We're just doing this. A sir reply is necessary to strike an admissible hearsay evidence and new evidence contained in the supplemental Paulson Declaration. We get to talk about hearsay, y'all. I think hearsay is not a well um, understood concept by non-lawyers. So it'll be fun to talk about for a minute because, you know, you hear on every legal show ever like, objection, hearsay. But it's like, but what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> Sometimes I say it in social contexts and then it's like, uh... People are like, what do you mean objection hearsay? So thank you very much, Diva. If anybody is getting buffered, it's generally on YouTube's end. This is a fantastic suggestion. Um, plaintiffs seek to file a sir reply to strike the following inadmissible hearsay statements from paragraph three of the supplemental Paulson Declaration. Let's get to the footnote. Then it goes into the Federal Rules of Evidence 802. In the absence of a procedural rule or statute, hearsay is inadmissible unless it is defined as non-hearsay under the Federal Rules of Evidence 801D or falls within a hearsay exception under 803, 804, 807. Deep, deep law nerdy shit. But hearsay is generally shit other people said that's not admissible because you don't have foundation for it. There are rules around that. That is a very, very brief and rough summation of hearsay, but objection hearsay, like here's, here's an easy way that objection hearsay comes up, um, and came up in like criminal cases. It's like, Hey, did you see witness X, Y, and Z happening? Yes. I saw X, Y, and Z. And then so-and-so said, blah, 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 blah. If blah, 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 blah is being offered to prove that it happened, you can't admit somebody else's statements to prove that a thing happened. So that would come up. If you're admitting it just to say, I heard somebody yell because they're yelling, it's on fire, and I saw it's on fire, and that's what drew my attention, the statement, it's on fire, is not to say that's proof it's on fire. It's to say that's what got my attention. Hopefully that is a very good brief summation of hearsay. I feel like at some point, I know that Illegal Eagle does this and others. I feel like at some point I need like a little series of like little areas of law so I can be like, just refer back to my hearsay video and just do some quick little like lawyer snippets of, well, this is this and that is that. <laughs> Defamation is this. Three minute video. Hearsay is this. Mm, 15 minute video at a minimum because I talk a lot. So this is what they're trying to strike. Quote, it is my understanding that both of these websites are accessible globally and include information and records at least from all over the United States. Footnote three, supplemental policy and de declaration line three, and quote, the document images were on the website itself. To my knowledge, they do not quote link to local websites in the various statutes or in the various states where the originals and records are stored. So this is coming from the declaration attached to the defendant's reply to the plaintiff's opposition to the motion to dismiss. These statements are purported to be offered for the truth, saying it is KJ's understanding of what these are. So KJ is saying, this is my understanding of these website, websites that were cited, Ancestry.com in my life. But it's not... It's offering it for the truth that Ancestry and my life don't access Washington records, but she wouldn't have had the foundation to say that because she's not an expert on how Ancestry.com and my life works. There's been no foundation laid for that saying, I understand how this works. This is how I understand how that works. This is why I know how that works. It's just saying, well, no, these are accessible globally. Well, do you know that? No. Okay. Then you can't offer it for the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter being that this is an international website. The truth of the matter being that these do not link to local websites. If you are 
you know, I was formerly employed by Ancestry.com. And at that time, this is how it ran, then maybe. But anyway, that's the argument here going on. Ms. Paulson's statements, which are pure speculation, are on how records are retrieved and used by Ancestry.com and MyLife.com are provided only to prove the truth of the matter asserted. It's like I just said that because I'm a lawyer. Um, that Ancestry.com and MyLife.com are accessible globally and that the records from Ancestry.com and MyLife are from all over the United States and that the records do not link, right? There's no way that she would know that. Further, Ms. Paulson lacks any personal knowledge of the matter because if she had personal knowledge, it would have been in the declaration. Um, refer back to James Westbrook's definite de declaration when he talks about his knowledge of YouTube and why, or refer back to Saltsy's declaration in the motion to not delete your shit. Saltsy's declaration says, I understand how Twitter works. This is my experience with Twitter. I understand how this works. This is my experience with it. So you'll see those foundations laid out for personal knowledge, knowledge I have, um, not regard to speculative knowledge or knowledge that is not intrinsic to you. So going on, furthermore, Ms. Paulson lacks any personal knowledge of the matter, as Ms. Paulson has not set forth a foundation establishing that she is an expert or representative of Ancestry.com or MyLife.com, footnote four, and then it goes into the federal rules of evidence. Again, as I said, laying out your personal knowledge for a thing. Plaintiffs also seek to file sir reply to strike paragraph four of the supplemental Paulson declaration in its entirety as it, it, it con constitutes an admissible hearsay and new evidence. Footnote five, it is not acceptable legal practice to present new evidence or new argument in a reply brief. And then it has the case law for that. It's like, we just, we said that, we said that, <laughs> we said that. Um, they needed to. The arguments in the reply brief from my perspective were way better than the arguments in the motion itself. Yes, opening brief, it's the motion. But in the motion, the arguments were not nearly as clear and, and concise as the motions in the reply. But a lot of the arguments in the reply were new arguments based on new case law that wasn't presented in the underlying motion itself. Ms. Paulson purports to testify about the results of her search of her research on YouTube's analytics. Hey, I said that in my video. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I, I said that in my video. I said, Hey, law students, tell me if you think there's foundation for this because she was purporting to testify to the contents of the document. Anyway, it's, it's fun to see that I'm not the only one seeing the things that I'm seeing. Um, testifying about the results of her research on YouTube analytics and the data she extrapolated from reviewing such analytics, but fails to provide the actual records of the analytics. Ms. Paulson's statement is being offered for the truth of the matter asserted that only 0.07% of her subscribers live in Washington, and it does not meet any of the exceptions to hearsay under Federal Rule of Evidence 803. The testimony, therefore, is inadmissible hearsay. Footnote 6, um, Federal Rule of Evidence. In addition, this statement also constitutes new evidence because Ms. Paulson's previous declaration stated, oh, the shade. <laughs> To my knowledge, neither I nor without a, nor WOACB, without is not two words, WOACB has any subscribers in Washington. So that's the previous declaration. Now she is admitting that she has subscribers in Washington. Oh, the, the thing, it, it made a noise and it changed. My kid was messing with my subscriber counter and it just hit 76.2. Did you guys hear the noise it made? I think my son changed my settings. <laughs> Now she is admitting that she has subscribers in Washington, but, but stating they constitute a small portion of her overall subscriber base. Furthermore, evidence as to defendant's current subscriber base lacks foundation and is irrelevant to the issue of jurisdiction as it does not disclose the amount of actual Washington viewers and paid Washington members that paid defendants to view the defamatory and harassing materials alleged in the complaint at the time of their publication. Footnotes 7 and 8 both going to the declaration and the rules of evidence. Similarly, plaintiffs seek to file a sir reply to strike the following statement in paragraph five of the supplemental Paulson declaration, as it is also inadmissible hearsay and new evidence. 
quote, in fact, approximately 40% of my viewers, this, this still gives me issue. 0.7% of subscribers, 40% of viewers, apples, oranges. Approximately 40% of my viewers are from outside the United States. Again, Ms. Paulson's statements purports to summarize analytics in a record that has not been provided to the court and such statement is submitted for the truth of the matter asserted, agreed. Likewise, the statement presents new evidence that should have been included in the opening brief. Furthermore, said evidence lacks foundation and is irrelevant in that Ms. Paulson not only fails to identify the whereabouts of the approximately 60% of her viewers, which are not the same as subscribers, right. I said that too. But she also fails to identify how many Washington viewers and Washington members that paid defendants to view the defamatory and harassing materials identified in the complaint at the time of its publication. Plaintiffs respectfully seek, respectfully ask for leave to file sir reply to strike the above referenced evidence. Footnote nine, federal rule of evidence. And then this gets into why it's necessary. The test that the Oh, uh, nope. This is more plaintiffs seek to file a sir reply to strike evidence submitted in defendant supplemental request for judicial notice. So there was also a motion to strike evidence with regard to the first request for judicial notice, and they are now asking to strike it again. So in the opposition to the motion to dismiss, there was also a motion to strike the judicial notice or the request for judicial notice. And that request for judicial notice had the Swanson complaint and a whole bunch of videos, including Shane Dawson reacting to breaking my silence and um, a number of other videos, including Trisha Paytas's like Toddy is dumb as hell video and some other stuff. So there was already a motion to dismiss that. So now we are getting into the please dismiss the supplemental request for judicial notice. Because the two separate Los Angeles Superior Court proceedings have no direct relation to the matters at issue, defendants request judicial notice of one, a motion to vacate filed 2016 in Los Angeles Superior Court case, and two, a motion to dismiss filed by plaintiffs along with others in separate unrelated Los Angeles Superior Court case. So in this reply, the defendants, KJ, attached a motion to dismiss that was filed by Toddy Westbrook's team in the business partner lawsuit and a motion to vacate that was filed by Saltsy in an underlying matter regarding James Westbrook. And they allege that the James Westbrook declaration in that motion to dismiss directly conflicts with the declaration in this motion, though I think that gets into parsing residency versus domicile but we talked about that in like two other videos and we've been talking for almost two hours at this point. So we're going to keep moving. It is not proper pursuant to federal rule of evidence 201 B because the proceedings do not have direct relation, uh, direct relation to the matters at issue here, footnote 11. And then it goes into the law that they are alleging. The court may take judicial notice of quote proceedings in other courts, both within and without the federal jurisdiction system if those proceedings have direct relation to the matters at issue. I imagine defense would say, well, he's in a statement saying where he lives then, and he's in a statement saying where he lives now, so those are related, but the proceedings themselves don't relate, though the defense would probably argue that the proceedings do relate because um, perhaps they would argue, though they're not going to get to argue it because this is a Sir reply, and it was brought up secondarily and could have been brought up in the original one, but either way, argue that some of the defamatory statements may have relied on the underlying James Westbrook Hawks case and saying, no, that case is related because some of the alleged defamatory materials relate out of that case. But even if that's the argument, then um, they would have a needed to make it earlier because this is new evidence in a reply. So it kind of shakes out the same. And then that's how I would parse that. And that's how I would argue that on both sides. Like I get it, but I also get how you could kind of make that argument too, that it's related. Even if judicial notice of such documents is proper, this constitutes new evidence. It's like, I just said that this is what you get when a first look, you get to see me break it down and then keep reading and go, Oh, 
<laughs> choo choo, we're all on the same train of thought. I love this in legal documents, this even if argument. A, it's something I do a lot or did in my own practice before I was just consulting. And it's something that really made it easy when I was a research attorney because it's, I don't have to parse that conversation that we just had because it's like, even if they're related, then it's still not proper because of this. And it's like, okay, we'll take this part of the argument out. Even if, even if you find that this is that it's still not enough. I find those arguments to be very powerful because it just keeps you uh, moving in the arguments and in, in the main point of the thing. And the main point of the thing is it's still new evidence. Um, that should have been def submitted in defendant's opening brief. I swear you guys, we're doing a first look. <laughs> so I haven't pre-read the arguments. Which <laughs> defendants rely upon out of context statements with the documents in their reply. C, defendant supplemental request for judicial notice. While plaintiffs do not dispute the accuracy of the documents, documents cited by defendants were filed by plaintiffs for a limited purpose and cannot be used as evidence to otherwise mislead this court into believing plaintiffs have testified inconsistently in this case. It is well established that a person may have more than one residence, but only one domicile. It's like we keep talking about that in this case. Footnote 13 cites case law saying that residency means an established abode for personal or business reasons, permanent for a time. Again, a hotel may be a residence for a time. A residence is so determined from the physical fact of that person's living in a particular place. Like because your butt's there, you're there. One may have more than one residence in different parts of the country or the world, but a person may only have one domicile. A person may be a resident of one locality, but be domiciled in another. And that happens quite frequently, especially with regards to people who are either um, nomad entrepreneurs, people who are in the military. So people who are in the military might be residents out of the country or in another state, but domiciled in their home state. Plaintiffs respectfully request to file, um, request leave to file a sir reply to strike. And so that is the end. That is the end. That is the end. So we'll see. The judge, here's what happens next. Let's pull this back up. Um, I'm going to pull this over so I can read it because I've got my stuff split screened because we're going to pull up Twitter in just a second and then we're going to wrap up. Um, the number of law nerds watching matches how many subscribers Emily had when a lot of us found her. That's true. <laughs> watching at the moment. That's true. For those of you that found me as my channel was just grow. That's so true. I love this comment so much. Thank you, Chimera. Um, there, there, as my um, Kanye West videos started gaining traction, my Friday Night Lives had more and more viewers. And there was a Friday Night Live right before this defamation case was filed where I was like, we're pushing towards 5,000, you guys. We're almost at 5,000 subs. And that was literally like the Friday right before Halloween. So what, October 29th, 30th ish. And, and here we are in the middle of January at 76.2 thousand subs. It's just amazing. And the subs, I, it, it means there's more law nerds in the family. Yes. It's always fun to have subscriber numbers and yes, I want to dye my hair purple, but having you all as part of my community is the part that makes it so special. Cause I love our conversations together. And it means I get to be a full-time legal commentator, which is my favorite Thing ever. Like, I love this shit. You can tell I love this shit. So here's my thoughts on the motion to file sir reply, or here's what's happening next. So the judge will either allow leave to file the sir reply or not. It's going to depend on if the research attorney and the judge have already gotten through the other shit and are like, no, no, we know. They might deny the the leave to file sir reply because they might be like, yeah, 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 we know it's new. Like it, we've in our minds, we've already like handled it or they might grant it they can then rule on the pleadings. So the judge can just say, I've read all this stuff. This is my ruling. The judge can set it for a noting date and take argument on it. So we'll see what the judge decides to do with regard to how they're going to rule on this. They might rule on the papers. They might have argument. That will be what comes next because now, now all of the documents are filed. We are all of the documents with regard to the motion to dismiss are filed. It is done. The next thing that will happen is the judge will rule on 
No. The next thing that will happen with regard to the motion to dismiss is that the judge will rule on it. That doesn't necessarily mean shit won't happen before then. And I am getting vibes and have been getting vibes that that is going to happen based on A, shenanigans, and B, Twitter activity. So Salty's Twitter. Two hours ago says, and then I'm going to get to a quick questions and then we're going to be done for the day. Uh, here's the first one from January 12th, 2021, 10 AM, my time. Please let me or at Lonnie ESQ know if you have any evidence that KJ has deleted relevant evidence, e.g. videos, chats, comments, tweets. This includes deleting statements from viewers stating they are from Washington and IG or YouTube videos containing chat messages about the case. Um, Please provide us with information as to date, name of video, timestamp if possible, and your contact information as in case we have any questions. Also, please let myself or Lonnie ESQ know if you are willing to sign a declaration as to your observations. I imagine that what is brewing here, and I have said this since the stipulation was filed, and I can't wait to get in and go read all of the statements. But when the stipulation was filed with regards to not deleting your shit and the agreement to not delete your shit, which let me know if it would be helpful if I pull up that stipulation and let you know. When that stipulation was filed, I was like, oh, but stuff keeps missing. Stuff keeps going missing. So I think that there will probably be an OSC filed. I've been saying this since I saw stuff happening on Twitter because the Twitter sleuths of the world are like, comments have been deleted. This has been deleted. Stuff has been deleted. And that all went down or was going down right around the same time that there was that uh, like December 29th video that then had Salty's team filing an additional um supplemental opposition because there was more information with regard to Washington subscribers and Washington members to the without a crystal ball channel. So a lot has happened. A lot has happened in a very quick period of time because of things that have happened on the interwebs. Okay. There are a few, um, super chats and some new members. Welcome to all the new members. Michael super chatted and said, when is the Ringo release date? I don't have a release date yet, Michael, but once I do, I'll let everyone know. Uncivil said, if you feel like dancing, well, come on, it's up to you. We've got the sound to keep you getting down, <laughs> down. The train is coming through. C come on, ride the train. Should I sing it? I should have sang it, but like, then we get to come on, ride the train and ride it. Come on, ride the train, choo-choo train. Thank you, Uncivil. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> That's a throwback for me to being in college because it was always, always on the radio when I was in college. You couldn't get through like a frat party or even like a road trip with my water polo team with that like, I think I can, I think it can. Oh, I'm going to tangent forever on that. Thank you for that super chat, Uncivil. <laughs> um and I think I can pull these other super chats from the bottom and then do a few questions. Ah, there it was. If you feel like dancing. Okay, we're done. We're done with Emily singing. <laughs> because it's ridiculous. Um, new to your channel from Vancouver Island. Hello. Unsure whether I will make it um, one day, but I am considering law school and I'm inspired by your content. Thank you so much. It is definitely a personal choice. And it depends a lot on cost too. There are a lot of things you can do in the world without a law degree, but some things you can only do with a law degree. So thank you for that. And I, I appreciate, I appreciate it. I love, I love, I found a lot of inspiration in things. I mean, not YouTube because there was no YouTube, but in blogs and the people I would watch for sure. So, um, Confused Brit, why hasn't Mr. Trump been arrested in the UK? <laughs> Trump being so uh, Not diving into the politics today, but there are no charges at this point on which to arrest him. So in the US, if you are going to arrest somebody, charges have to be brought first. And then the person is, well, that's not true. Police can contemporaneously see an act happening. Like if you see someone 
um, breaking into a home, you can arrest them. If you see someone drunk driving, you can arrest them. But if you aren't contemporaneously seeing the activity and contemporaneously arresting them for it, then there would have to be charges filed. So there is a lot of political process going on with that. So can you and Uncivil do a breakdown of Parler's Amazon case? I, I mean, has Uncivil already broken it down? I don't know, but we can definitely talk about it. Um, I have not pulled the legal documents yet on Parler's case. I've gone through it. I've gone through the reporting of it. I have not pulled the whole reporting on it. I know that Nick Ricada has covered it too. Um, motion for Nate, Uncivil, and Emily Roundtable to discuss the Parler lawsuits. Well, we have definitely talked about it. We will. I will talk to. The, I will talk to the gentleman about it, about doing a roundtable. We, I really enjoyed our last roundtable. It was quite a lot of fun. So, okay. I'm going to look for a few more questions. I had asked if it would be helpful to pull up that stipulation and I see some of you saying yes. So let me do that real quick. Um, so let's pull it up. Y'all can, y'all can continue to chat amongst yourself. Let me see where it is because I have the stipulation in the file stipulation to not delete your shit. This is why I think this is coming based on what they're looking for. And based on just what I observed up on the Twitters. So this is the order. This has been signed by the court. I have not pulled up the signed one, but this has been signed by the court. It is a court order. Violating a court order can hold one in contempt of court, but at least it's enough to bring a motion for contempt. So the court can be like WTF is happening. It is ordered defendants KJ and without a crystal ball are hereby ordered to preserve all published content within their custody or control that they know or have reason to know is either relevant to the matter or could reasonably be expected to lead to the discovery of relevant information in this matter. That's where the comments I think are going to come in. The argument I would make there is that comments can lead to witnesses. So that can lead to discovery including without limitation, social media content on any platform, including but not limited to all the big ones, videos, all live chats and streams, including live videos. So that means if there was a Instagram live and it wasn't preserved, that's a problem. If there was chat that was deleted, that's a problem. Comments on social media posts and videos. Um, further ordered to preserve all published content within their custody or control, that they know or have reason to know is relevant to this matter or could reasonably be expected to lead to discovery, direct and instant messages sent and received, emails, texts, phone messages, all the other stuff. Defendants failure to comply with this order may subject defendants to sanctions, including sanctions for civil contempt. So that is why the questions and the I don't know, investigation or the request for evidence on Twitter leads me to believe this is the direction this is going in. Back before the supplemental um, motion was filed, I also, there, I don't know if it was the December 29th video, there was other stuff I saw on social where it's like, ooh, it looks like stuff might have been deleted. This stipulation, by the way, is not a, um, is not a unique stipulation. There is an obligation to preserve evidence in the course of a normal litigation. So it's not like this is something weird. It had to be ordered because plaintiffs were arguing it wasn't being adhered to. And that moves along that motion to not delete your shit because otherwise the court would be like, y'all, there is a litigation obligation to not delete your shit. Why do I have a motion in front of me for basic shit? Can we get it together? Get it together. I think that's why there's a stipulation here. So the judge is not put on the back foot over all of this because it is one of the basic tenets of civil litigation that this is an obligation that has to be done. So, all right. Um, I appreciate my mods looking out for me saying, do not get yourself copyright striked for singing music. I don't sing it that well <laughs> that I think that the uh, copyright system will come for me. I don't think it's close enough at all, but I appreciate it. That's why we keep it to 15 seconds. <laughs> so um, let me see if I missed any questions. 
Question, if plaintiff does not bring a contempt motion, can the judge still move forward with a contempt charge based on the filed documents? Victoria, the judge can bring contempt on their own. I don't know if they will this early in a case. It would be very unusual um, for a judge to do that. They absolutely can. I don't think that they, like, I don't know if they would this early because generally with deleting stuff, it would be the other party saying this is a problem. So let me let me get into a few more. A question, how accurate do we think YouTube really is with the numbers where the viewers and subscribers are located considering so many people use VPNs to hide their actual location? Laura, I don't know. I think that's something that's going to have to come up. What the judge can do with this is say, um, hey, I need more information. So if the judge is not sure that the contacts with the form state are enough, the judge can ask for more information and stay ruling on this motion. Like, I'm not going to rule on this. I want more information. And this is the information I want. So that can happen. And we'll see. Um, I saw another question from Serena. Where do I submit my application to be a ride or die mod? So we are working on that. So we will get that. Thank you for asking. But we will have a process to do that down the road and let you know. Bree said, question, when will the judge make a decision on the dismissal? Do we have a date yet? No, we don't. And that will depend how the judge decides to do it. So no, we don't have a date yet that I've seen. Um, the judge can put up a noting date or the judge can rule on the papers and then just put up a ruling on PACER. That can happen too. So I wouldn't necessarily expect it um, this week. Like that would be really fast. I, I would expect this to have some time for the court to read through it, but we'll see if there's a minute order put out or something happens. I will, we're, we're going to, we're going to follow everything that goes up in the court with this because by now we're all way too deeply invested and we all want to know. And then once we know what's going on with jurisdiction, there should be a long pause for discovery with occasional discovery motions and minute orders and things like that. That's what should happen. If that's what will happen, I do not know. I do not know. So um, let me see. What else? Question. With all the BS KJ is posting in the last few days, um, is posting the last few days to possibly get her socials banned? Could that be contempt? I... I Text zombie lover, that assumes a lot of information that we just don't have because uh, we just don't have. Um, so we don't know. It would have to be preserved. So on the back end, it would have to be preserved. Um, if this becomes an issue, I'm sure the lawyers involved will just ask the court for a leave to file uh, subpoenas for social medias be if they think it's an issue. So we will see how much of an issue they think it is because we will see if there are um, motions filed to preserve that evidence. We don't know. There might already be preservation letters sent to social medias. That can happen behind the scene. Like, hey, there's litigation going on with this. You, Twitter, are aware. So you need to preserve everything that happens on this account. We don't know if that's happened or not in this case, but it's not to say it can't. So um, let me see if I, and I don't know what is, I have not followed um, what's going on on KJ's socials really closely. So I don't know what's being posted. I'm also blocked. So I will go and look at hashtags later today and see. Um, yeah, it's fine. Whatever. Engagement's engagement, y'all. Um, I have not quit consulting. I'm just more limited in my consulting because uh, busy. <laughs> busy, busy, busy. Question, can the judge throw out KJ's whole second filing for not adhering to court rules on page format? Um, Lori, they could. I don't know if they will. The court did give a pretty strong minute order like, hey, there's a standing order. I would imagine that the court will admonish it in their ruling, call it out in their ruling, but no, because what a court will often do once we've gotten this far into motion is the court would say, go back and try again. And the court really might just not want to waste the time. I believe the same judge that's been assigned to this case was assigned to the parlor case. So the judge is going to be busy anyway, and it might be that it's admonished in this um, for a do not let this happen again, but we will see. The court also said 
this time I'm giving a slightly longer page limit per these rules. This time I'm allowing this to happen. I'm just surprised the 45 line pages weren't corrected in this one because it's an easy thing to switch up. And it's one of the things that is in the standing order, but there might've been a decision why not to, to just keep it consistent for their motions. Who knows? So we will see, but I don't think the court would bounce it. I think the court would more likely say, do not do this again. So that's kind of my take on it just from the judges I worked with. They really, once you got deep into motion practice, it annoyed the judges I worked with, but they generally wouldn't, unless it was super egregious, they wouldn't throw a motion out, but it definitely gets a head tilt. And the judge might choose to not consider the new cases and say, no, these are new cases. This is new evidence in a reply to an opposition. So I'm not I'm not going to give weight to those cases. They weren't argued. So, um, uh, you have a question regarding the stat discovery. I, 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 I'm trying to pull questions as I see them, but that would come the statistics on the socials. A lot of them would come from the back end of socials. Um, do interrog somebody asked, did interrogatories get posted on Twitter? If they're in a motion, yes. If they're just sent between the parties, no. Hopefully that helps. Um, question. I know you have done white collar crimes in the past. Can you at some point cover some of this stuff in the future or talk about what forensic accountings look like? I, I can. I mean, it seems like what we need is maybe a breakdown at some point of some of the basic fundamentals underlying lawsuits that we talk about. And that would be a, a helpful time, but I would have to find a forensic accountant and bring them in and do a collab because I am not a forensic accountant. I know what it looks like for me to read it. I don't know what it looks like for them to do it. I know the kind of stuff we would ask for, but I think that would be really fun to bring a forensic accountant in and do that. So, um, <laughs> I love you guys that are, you're, you're just ready for it. Thank you, Cade. Um, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready for the purple hair. So <laughs> thank you, Eileen. I know a lot of you are, are OGs who have been here for a while. So um, let me see if there's one last question I can get and go from there. And then I'm going to, then I'm going to do the seventh wrap up and say goodbye. I know uh, Diva is totally right. We do owe the Law Nerds two celebration milestones. One is going to be the Ringo video for 69,000 subs. We have to do something for 75,000 subs. So we're going to have to do that too. How long do I anticipate this case to last fucking ever? For fucking ever. Once they get into discovery, discovery is going to take time. And then depositions are going to take time. The depositions are going to take time. So, um... Let me see. There was another question I saw that I wanted to answer, and that would be my last. Um, I didn't know this. Caffeine Queen said, question, does KJ's Twitter being marked as sensitive and Instagram banning her from going live affect her case in any way? I didn't know that that had happened. Um, I saw the sensitive thing. I didn't know about IG. Will she face legal consequences if either platform bans her? I, I really don't know. It's going to be up for a court to decide, not for me. Um, but again, if there's already letters to preserve and they get that, it's probably better, uh, to not have to worry about IG lives and not IG lives not being saved since this stipulation has been ordered. And really since the beginning of the case, it's, I don't know. So I don't know. It's going to depend on the judge and it's going to depend on the sides to argue it. So, um, <laughs> Michael, how long do you think this case will take the, a defamation case is going to um is going to take time. Once they get into discovery, discovery is going to take time. Once they get into depositions, depositions are going to take time. So this could easily be a two or three year case. I hope, I hope that it won't be that long and we get to see it. But <laughs> passenger shaming, could we please have nine wrap ups, Caitlin? <laughs> Diva is like, no, the mods have been here for over two hours already. All right. Um, last quest, last question. 
Last question. We're doing last question. Oh, and then I'm going to tell you the results of the Twitter poll, and then I'm going to say goodbye. Question. Salty has been looking for information regarding bot subs. If that, uh, what happens if he can prove this? It, I think it will have a, a number of questions on the case with regard to purchase subs. So the thing is subs and views are going to be different. So with regard to the defamatory statements, I think there's not really an argument with regard to subs being so relevant to the defamatory statements. The subs are really relevant to the declaration saying, I don't have any subs in Washington, so I don't have contacts with Washington for the purposes of jurisdiction. But the argument could be is, excuse me, if subs are purchased, are they purchased to diminish the percentage of subscribers in a certain place? So is it a false number that's being attested to like that 0.07 is that number not an accurate number because it's been artificially uh, kerfuffled with based on purchasing subs but it might also go to the fact that purchasing subs are against terms of use um so there are allegations that I saw on Twitter out there about this. He, it seems, is investigating all of those allegations. Again, we've pulled up some of Salty's other cases that he's talked about on Twitter. He's not going to let anything go at this point. And she kind of went after him. So it's not going like, look, she's riled the lawyers, the lawyers substantially. Um, I'm, I'm not as riled because like I'm not involved in the case, but the lawyer involved in the case, I've seen the shit on Twitter. Like don't rile the lawyers because the lawyers will turn over every stone in defense of their clients. And that's, what's going to happen in this case. But is it against YouTube terms of service? I think so. I think it definitely is. I, I think it absolutely is. So y'all, Thank you for being here. This has been a long one. They're all long ones. I will do the things with the time stamping so you guys can go back and watch it by uh, by minute. And yeah, what else did I say I would do as we wrapped up? There was something else and I've already forgotten. <laughs> I love this so much. I saw this. I love this so, so much. Um, hello from Poland. Thank you. Um, it... For this question about whether previous crusades against other YouTubers can be evidence here, it's very much going to depend on how this case parses out. And we're too far away from that. Twitter poll, thank you. See, you also saw me lose my train of thought. We're too far away from that to know what's going to come up at trial. The thing is, things can become relevant at trial from one side kicking open a door that you didn't think were going to be relevant literally like 20 minutes before. You're like, this is never going to be relevant. And then somebody says something and you're like... Well, fuck, it's relevant now. So we never know. Let me pull up the Twitter poll. And um, yes. Let's see. Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. Oh, I don't need to do it on my phone. I have Twitter on my computer. Emily, Twitter's on your computer, girl. You already pulled it up. You guys don't follow me on Twitter. Come on over and follow me on Twitter. Let me pull up my own Twitter real quick. And show you guys the Twitter poll regarding the ever present is a hot dog, a sandwich. My family and I had a lot of fun with that debate. We, um, we are still debating it. We did watch the food theory video about it. It's fascinating. And then I put up a Twitter poll asking, and let me see if I can find the results of that poll. So I loved it. Friday night live. We will do another Twitter poll about something else, but <laughs> is a hot dog a sandwich? Sandwich, 23.9. Not a sandwich. What the fuck are you thinking, girl? 76.1. And there were some fantastic responses here from the community. So if you guys haven't read these, they're hilarious. The comments were a lot of fun. <laughs> On day eight, God created baloney for hot dog lovers who wanted a sandwich. <laughs> He wanted me to tell you that all mystery meat be nasty. Apparently sarcasm doesn't work well in meats and he kind of regrets the whole baloney thing. Amen. <laughs> you guys, this is so fantastic. And it was so much fun to see everybody's response to it. I think we're going to have to keep doing uh, fun debates because this was such a joyful, fun, punky little debate. So we'll, we'll do another one on Friday. I will take suggestions. Um, 
I, I will let you know how I will take suggestions because there's one I think I might just do that I got asked on social, but I will take suggestions for them. I will let you guys know how I'm going to take suggestions. I'll let you know in the text crew on the, um, on the community tab here and on social. So um, it's a taco. It's a taco has come up a lot. <laughs> no, then it would be bologna, not in Australia. It's a taco. <laughs> I love this. So if you guys haven't read the responses here, there are quite, as you can see, there are quite a lot of them. Quite a lot. It was a really, really fun debate. I loved it. Um, <laughs> I'm here for this GIF and I'm here for hot dog tea too. So no, but lasagna is just spaghetti flavored cake. <laughs> you guys, I'll tell you what, I am just dead. <laughs> so gender right, I love this gift too. So thank you guys. Um, if you want to read all of the comments, this was a super hot thread, like hot takes, hot takes. There's still more. There's still more. There are still more. You guys, I love it. So if you don't follow me on the socials, go and do it. I'm at the Emily D. Baker. Oh, and I told you at the top. So for everybody who stayed since the whole thing here, we'll do all the socials that Instagram was almost at 14,000, 14,000 law nerds up on the IG. Let's see if we, oh yes, we are at 14,000. Ah, that's not going to do it. That's not going to, that's not going to focus. See, this is why I don't, ah, oh, there we go. Yay. Thanks friends. We hit 14,000 on Instagram. Um, if you don't follow me on Twitter, that's where that poll is. I'll pin it to the top. Um, so you guys can see it. I'm going to do that right now. Cause otherwise I'll log off and totally forget. So we're going to make that the pinned comment. So you guys can go see it. And then we will pick something to do on Friday. I will let you know how we're going to do it. You guys are the best. I loved this so much. I loved this so much. Passenger savings, like, yeah, um, get it 14K at passenger shaming with your millions and millions of followers and your amazing content. I love your account so much. If you guys don't follow passenger shaming on Instagram, hilarious shit. I absolutely love it. So thank you guys so much. Um, you guys are absolutely my heart. I love getting to spend time with you. I love getting to be live with you. I intend to drop the podcast tomorrow at 11 a.m. with premiere chat and no after party because I have a bunch of other crap I have to do. If I go live at all tomorrow, it will be on the Instagrams. Friday Night Live will happen. We, um, if anything else breaks, I will keep you guys posted and drop videos. I always give the mods the heads up before we go live. So I always touch base with them first, but we will just see what happens this week. I look there th tomorrow's podcast is going live talking about politically types of things, but also there is going to be a vote on impeachment tomorrow. Like stuff is going to happen. So if we need to go live, I will let you know, but it is my intention to drop that with soup with, chat on and premiere and then see what happens the rest of the day and parse it. So thank you guys so much. Um, I adore you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being awesome law nerds. I will, it's saying goodbye is so hard, but I'm actually really hungry. So I'm going to go do that because we've been live for fucking ever. I love you guys. I will see you in the next one. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D Baker. The podcast is the Emily show podcast. So if you're ready to ride it on, head over to lawnerdshop.com, your place for all your law nerd needs, stickers, t-shirts, sweatshirts, and more coming soon. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com, happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube 